There is nothing better than a midweek worship service. Amen? Whew. Thank you, Jesus, for that. That is so great, so great, so great. Um, it is great to be back in the pulpit on Wednesdays. Um, I'm thankful for those uh, elders that fill in and can do so. And uh, I think the Spirit of God is leading uh, chapter 20, specifically the second half, is, is something only the senior pastor can teach. I hate to say it like that, but it's the truth. And uh, so we are in Acts chapter 20. Um, we are going to do a, a 30,000 foot verse by verse. So if you don't have your Bible, grab your Bible and buckle your seatbelt. We are going to have fun tonight. Chapter 19, though, the Holy Spirit was doing some amazing things in Ephesus. Amazing. Oh, gosh, the work that God was doing through Paul. Paul had a teaching ministry. Wow, he was teaching, equipping the saints with the word of God. And then miraculous things started to happen with his sweatbands and these handkerchiefs. And people, they were just taking them. Paul wasn't going, here, take my handkerchief. You know I'm a, I'm a holy man. They were just by faith taking these articles of Paul and laying them on the sick, and they were being healed. Like, like I mean, like people's faith. What does that say about their faith in Ephesus? What is that saying about their faith? Not in Paul, but in the God Paul was preaching. Like God's on the move, right? And the Spirit was exposing false teaching. He was, he was, the Spirit was manifesting the, the things that were perverted and, and pagan and, and not of God. In verses 18 through 20 in chapter 19, we see what appears here to be nothing short of a spiritual revival. Many, were, many believers were confessing their sin. Guys, listen. There's power. Oh, there's power. Wonder-working power in confessing your sin. Confess it. Confession's good for the soul. And they're confessing their sin. And they're burning their books, their pagan idolatry, all of this. Just burn it. Burn it all away. Just burn it. Just take it all away. Danny Donnelly sings. Just burn it all away. They come to the place, you know when you just draw so close to God, you're just, God, just take it all away. God, just burn it all. Just take all this garbage and burn it. That's, that's Repentance. Is it not? Here it says in verse 20, the word of the Lord, the logos in the Greek, the logos of the word, the logos of the Lord grew mighty. The, the logos of the word prevailed. The word there, right? It literally means that the logos, the word of the Lord was a force to be reckoned with. Oh, would I love to see that happen in Maricopa. Oh, cause pagans and sinners to just shrivel. Whoa. The reality of God. The reality of God moving. 19, verse 21. Paul purposed in the spirit. Wasn't, you, never, you know, you ever make up your mind, you're like, I purposed in my, in my heart. I purposed in my, you purposed. But Paul purposed in the spirit. Made a spiritual decision when he had passed through Macedonia to go to Achaia, and then he said, and then on to Jerusalem, and after that, he says, I must go see Rome. Now, the reality is, as we go through this, oh, he's going to get to those places, but not the way he wished he would get to them. He would get to them bound as a prisoner. Won't be under the conditions <clears throat> that he wished. 22, Paul set Timothy and uh, Erastus ahead, go on to Macedonia. All through this, we're going to see where he keeps sending his team kind of ahead of him. You know, I, I, I'll be straight. I'm, I'm, why are you doing that? Are they preparing something, kind of going before him with the ministry? There was something spiritual about sending these men at times ahead of himself. Paul stayed in Asia for some time, 23 and then there arose a great commotion about Christianity, about the way. The way, just the way. The way, not the way to San Jose. 
the way to Jesus. It was the way to Jesus. Do you know the way to Jesus? Not the way to San Jose. I-5 takes you to San Jose. Do you know the way to Jesus? This was Paul's message, 24. But it wasn't Demetrius' plan, the silversmith, who made shrines to the goddess Diana, right? A pagan temple there in Ephesus. But this Demetrius, he caused a riot. 35. It took, verse 35 and 19, it took the city clerk eventually to just quiet the crowd down and bring some kind of civil law and order to the situation. And here we find ourselves in 20. It's amazing, though, how fast the Spirit of God can be moving in this powerful way. And then just moments later, you're under attack. It feels like you're just getting your butt handed to you. You start asking yourself, what? what? Wait a minute, should I have left Ephesus like a, a week ago? You know, did I stay here too long, was Paul thinking? Have you been in a situation like that? Man, God's just moving. Woo-hoo! God's good. It's smooth, road smooth. Everything's going good. God's here. Boy, I just, oh, I just, I moved to Maricopa from Washington. Oh, glory to God. I love the sunshine. And then a year into it, you go, what happened? <laughs> Wheel fell off the bus. This is where we're at. What? What? Thank God. What, did, did God leave Paul? No, 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 no. Oh, no. God showed up. God was working, and the enemy showed up. Guys, listen, we're going through a month-long prayer and fasting. And I'm going to tell you, if you will join with us and fast one meal a day and pray, oh, you're going to get into battle. If you want to stay out of the battle, you don't want to get no scars, no scratches, no bruises, no wounds. You don't want to do any damage or get damaged. Just stay on the sidelines. Just stay on the sidelines. It's fine. Scoot over here. It's safe. Over here is real safe. But you go over here and you get on your knees. Oh, the enemy's going to show up. Don't we know? Don't we know? Paul, chapter 20. He departs from Macedonia, where uh, uh, he departs from Macedonia, where Timothy and uh, Rastus, where he had told them to go ahead and, and wait for him. This is modern Greece. Verses 2 through 5. Paul is encouraging the church that he had established back in chapters 16 and 17. He's encouraging the churches, and we'll see that even more powerfully as we finish out 20. And listen, and it's important to remember that here on this specific missionary journey, that he was collecting a fund. He was going to Jerusalem for, with purpose. He, he was collecting a financial support for from the Gentile churches he's planted, primarily Gentile, to take to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem who were being persecuted and they were hurting and they were hungry and they had big, huge needs. The church was being persecuted at this time in Jerusalem. How much more is the enemy on Paul's heels to keep him from delivering that provision to the church in Jerusalem from Gentile believers and what was this doing in the life of these Gentile believers in putting their hands in their pockets and pulling money out and supporting the Jewish believers? They were rivals. Now they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Unity. Does, does Satan like unity? No, man. No, no, no. Break the unity in the family. Break the unity in the church. Break the unity in the body of Christ. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Man, listen. Not in the house of God. And so you can see the enemies wanting to attack Paul's getting this relief fund together for these believers in Jerusalem. Verse 4. We got some guys here. Astarchus. Secundus. Both Thessalonians. Both from Thessalonians. It's funny, this, this Artars, Atar, Arist, Aristarchus, there we go, Aristarchus, he, this guy he, he was a, his name 
just tells us everything about him, particularly that he was an upperclassman, he was wealthy, he was powerful, and then Secundus was just the opposite. His name tells us everything about him, that he was a second-rate slave. A second-rate slave. Here we got these two traveling compartners, companions. This is what the gospel does. It unites people. It brings people that the world would normally not bring together. God brings together. That's just amazing. And again, the enemy's wanting to stop that kind of work. He's wanting to squinch it, squelch it, if you would. Now in verse 6, look at it with me. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. What jumps out to you, student, of the word? First off, who's the author of this letter? The one pinning it? Sir Luke. Mr. Luke himself. And now he's back to using the word we, not they. What I'm trying to point out here is if we remember, Paul had left Luke in Philippi back in Acts 16, verse 40. Now, here in this travel, Paul picked Luke back up as he sailed eastward back towards Rome at this particular moment. Luke is now with him. We. Verse 7. And on the first day of the week, all the way, Sunday morning, church, you got to love it. It's Sunday. It's Sunday. And the disciples came together to break bread. Paul, ready to depart, the next day spoke to them and continued this his message until midnight. He's there, bringing the word. One of the beautiful things about the Apostle Paul is that he, he cared so genuinely, and we're going to see this towards the end of 20, but when he planted a church, he didn't just blow in, blow up, and blow out. He was so concerned about the health of that church, and he understood that the health of that church depended on the health of the pastors and the bishops the eldership that was left over those churches. And so he would swing back through. And maybe he didn't always have an opportunity to speak to the whole church, but he always found opportunity to pull the leaders aside and to encourage them and to speak into their life. And this is what we have here. And he continued this message here. It says, until midnight. Have you ever heard... Have you ever heard of a long-winded goodbye sermon? This is a long-winded goodbye sermon. They're having church. This is one long Bible study. The message continued until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room. Good thing. Where they were gathered together, verse 9, and a window you know, set a certain young man, Right? who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was sinking so deep that he sunk out the window, overcome by sleep. Paul continued to be speaking. I love this. Just because somebody's falling asleep in the audience doesn't mean I'm going to stop talking. You know that's true on Sunday morning too. You can snooze all you want. That used to offend me. And my pastor told me one time, maybe the brother just needs some sleep. Let him sleep. Maybe he just is resting in Jesus. Let them rest. But they wouldn't let me do that in math class or in history class. You ever had the teacher come up? You're like, like <laughs> right? Because you went out too late, and then the teacher walks up and goes, bam! And you're, ah! Right? Good thing we don't do that in church. Now, but if Paul would have done that, they would have saved this kid from falling out the window. But the kid falls out the window, right? It's a bad situation. Three stories, and he's taken up dead. Verse 10, but Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him. And then he told him, don't trouble yourselves, for his life is still in him. Now, whether Paul healed him or whether Dr. Paul just figured, now he's got a heartbeat, he's good. Come on, let's get back to Bible study. <laughs> I 
Paul's got his priorities right anyway, right? <laughs> I mean, we would have stopped. Hold on, stop Bible study. We've got to call 911 and get an ambulance over here for this brother. Oh, don't worry about it. He's, he's br slightly breathing, but he's still breathing. You know? And Paul says, come on, let's just, let's just get back to the Bible study. That's hard. That's hardcore. <laughs> How many people in the church would be offended if we did that today? Some dude falls out the window and you'd be like, that pastor, he's a mean pastor. He didn't stop and call 911 on that dude. He just brought him back up. Well, that's what, and so here he's taken up. He prays and brings him back to life. Verse 11, and when he had come up, he had broken bread and they'd eat. They needed to eat. And they talked for a long while. So this thing continued until daybreak. And they departed. And the young man, right, they brought him in alive. And they were not a little comforted. They were extremely comforted by God. They were comforted that this went on all night long. They were comforted by the words of Paul that he spoke in the spirit. They were comforted by the fact this young man fell out a three-story window and was still okay. It was a good night. It was a good midweek Bible study. And here we are. Verse 13. And then we went ahead to the ship and we sailed to Assos. There intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, right? Intending himself to go on foot. For whatever reason here, the apostle Paul didn't want to get on the ship. He wanted to go from one city to the next on foot, yet everybody else had gotten on the ship. Some level of discernment? Probably so. And when he had met us, Assos, we took him on board and came to, I'm going to say this right, Mytilenia, Mytilenia, okay, I'm going to say, I thought it's pretty close, close as I'm going to get you, <clears throat> there you go, and if somebody wants to send me that tape hooked on phonics, I'd be greatly appreciated, <laughs> we sailed from there, and the next day came opposite, this is good, Chaos, right? Sounds like chaos is how this is pronounced. The following day, we arrived in Samsos and stayed there in Troy Gilliam. There we go. The next day, we came to Milantis. Miletus, Miletus, Miletus. There it is. For Paul had decided to sail past, past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. This was a goal of his, to be in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost with the church. Very important day. Why? Because the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost, right? Okay. So this is super important stuff here. Paul clearly couldn't go back into Ephesus or Asia at the time. Why? Because Demetrius and his goons were still looking for Paul. Okay? Paul didn't go looking for trouble necessarily. He went looking to preach the gospel. But his mission wasn't to go back into Ephesus and duke it out spiritually with these guys. His mission was to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. Right? Now, he really wanted to speak with the church leaders and elders there in Ephesus, though. There was a large church in Ephesus, and he had to leave quickly, chapter 19, because of Demetrius, because of the persecution. He had to get out quickly. And listen, this is really important. The Spirit was, and we're going to see it, the Spirit was already telling Paul, look, there's a good chance this is it for you. You're not going to make it back to Ephesus. You're not going to see these brothers and sisters again. This is your last opportunity to speak into their life, to encourage them. And so this is what he does. He, he goes on, he passes Asia and Ephesus over here to Miletus, Miletus okay, to Miletus. And, and, he, and Miletus is just a short stint, but it was just outside of Ephesus and Asia Minor, just on the borderline of being safe to stay there. And then they sent ahead, hey, tell the elders 
the leaders, the pastors of the home churches in Ephesus, Paul's over here and wants to speak with them. Well, they hightail it, right? And they get over here to Miletus. And Paul is going to speak into their lives. This right here is the meat of our passage in Bible study. For Miletus, chapter, verse, seven, uh, verse 17 of chapter 20, for Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, for that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed now, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities. And for those who were with me, I have shown you in every way, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And then all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Guys, that's a powerful, 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 powerful passage. Extremely powerful. In verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, you know, from the beginning how I lived among you. My life is a testimony, remember? Remember my lifestyle. Remember my integrity. Can they say that about you? As a man or woman, you're a leader. You're standing out. Stop being critical and Stupid and religious and be the real deal. Trade it in. I beg you, as Paul was begging these leaders, lay all the goofy, petty stuff aside. Paul's saying, I did. I didn't come to you with all this goofy, petty junk. My life is a testimony. That's so powerful. And I think every pastor and every church leader should make that their number one goal because that's where Paul starts. You have no right to get up here and sing. You have no right to stand up here and say anything if your life's not reflecting the love and very nature of God. 
And I see that's the biggest problem with the church. We poke all these problems, all the problems. There's men and women have no business being on this stage in churches all over the country. If Jesus was walking the earth, he'd fire most of them. Not because they don't know Greek and Hebrew and I can't say the word right. He wouldn't fire me for that. He'd fire me because I didn't have the integrity and the honesty and the character that's absolutely necessity for this position. That's where he started with these men. 19. And then listen, where does he go from there? Sounds like he's puffing himself up, doesn't it? He says, oh, no, no, no. 19. And serving the Lord with all humility in many, many tears and, and many trials which happened to me by the plotting of my enemies, by the Jews, by those who just don't understand the message of grace. They didn't get grace. By grace you have been saved. By faith, not of works, not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. They couldn't swallow that pill. They couldn't swallow it. I'm a servant, a slave, a servant. It means he's saying here, this is what I'm saying. I'm in bondage to be obedient and submissive to the will of God. I'm in bondage to be obedient and submissive to the will of God. It was that man who has every right to tell these elders and to charge them with the things he's charging them. Humble. And in verse 20, he goes on and says, I kept back nothing from you. But I proclaimed to you and taught you publicly from house to house. He's saying, I proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. And he'll say that in other times as well. How many ministers can say that? I'm just teaching the whole Bible. It takes the whole Bible to reach the whole world. Oh no, it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian to reach the whole world. Say that again. It takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian to reach the whole world. And Paul knows it. This is missionary Paul. Church planter Paul. I gave it, I kept back nothing from you. The whole council. Can you imagine how this made these elders feel? Great. Made them feel confident. Made them feel confident that I too will take the whole counsel to my flock. 21. It goes on, testifying to the Jews. Wait, 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 hold on. He just said, you know the things that happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And then he goes on and says, and testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, all repentance towards God and faith towards God, right in the Lord Jesus Christ. Testifying. This word means charging or, or being a witness. His gospel was not this watered down, fluffy cotton candy, feel good message. When he preached the gospel of grace, it was a charge. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved by grace through faith. It was a charge. Do it. He charged them. And his message was a witness. And people got saved. This is his testimony. He's testifying. And they too will do the same thing, I hope. And in 22, and see now, I'm going bound to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me there. He wasn't even sure if he'd make it to Jerusalem. But it's clear through the passage that he's trusting entirely in God. Entirely in whatever God, God, not thy will, but your will be done. Twenty-three. I don't know what's going to happen, except, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulation await me. I don't know when it's going to happen, but this is what the Spirit's saying is going to happen. Now, most of us would say, uh, can I have the check, please? 
uh, hold on, yeah, uh, oh yeah, God's calling me to go that way. How many of you have run from, from hard things in your life? Gave up when it got hard? Or when God was trying to produce something in you? Or to get you where he wants you? Guys, I hate to tell you the bad news, but nine times out of ten, it's not going to be some smooth little road. God's going to lay up you know, rose petals all the way down so you don't hurt your little feet. It's going to be difficult. And Paul knew that, and he embraced that by saying none of these things in verse 24. Nothing, none of these things move me. Nothing sways me. Nothing's going to redirect me from the purposes of God. They're sure. They're everlasting. They're like in concrete. Jesus said it. This is what he told me to do. I'm going to go do that. Period. Nothing's going to move me. When I broke this leg, I'm laid up, got a bar bolted to my red leg, and, 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 and the house is under contract, and, and I'm, I'm, they, they, they made a bed downstairs in the lower room, and, and I'm in traction, and, and it was a mess. It was a mess. And many people who love me dearly from church said, hey, let's put going to Crossville an hour and a half north and planting that church on hold. Let's put that on hold. Okay, just stay here, back out of the agreement. I'm sure you can back out. Everybody will understand and sell in the house. Just stay put. We'll love you. We'll take care of you. You're surrounded by a great body of Christ. Everybody, you know, get it. And then, 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 go, then go back up there and do it for God. And I almost had to say, get behind me, Satan. I said, can I ask you one question? Does, is God sovereign and omniscient and omnipresent and all that? And they said, well, yeah. I said, so then what you're telling me is God knew this was going to happen, right? Yeah. So the, the, the question now is, did I hear God correctly or did I miss what God said? I don't know. Well, I'm telling you, I heard God correctly. So I went to Crossville, me and my family, and I was in a wheelchair. And I planted a church in a wheelchair. You've been around me long enough. I was using a crutch as an oar. As I was coasting around, we rented a space for the church, and, and I, was using, I was using my crutch as a pointer. Paint that wall. Let's put a door over here. And God, you got a sick sense of humor. What a trial. But the work that God did in my life, I, I, would, I would do it all again. And that's where Paul's at. He understands that. He's got a closeness with God. He knows what's happening. The Spirit testifies in every city. Paul is willing to lay down his life for the gospel. I just think that we're losing sight of people that are willing to do that. He's a servant. And he's serving the purposes of God by saying none of these things move me. The things which I've received from the Lord. Do you know what you've received from God? Why give that away when it gets difficult? That makes no sense. That's not a demonstration of faith or trust. Paul knew there was no turning back. He understood that God was right there with him and he was right in the middle of God's will regardless of whatever happened. God was just as close to him in these trials, in these difficulties, in the uncertainty, as he was when people were being healed by his handkerchiefs. But most of us don't look at it that way. Look at 26. This is, this is getting so good. We're going to just keep going here. He says, look, uh, I, I, I don't count my life dear to myself, sorry, 24, to myself, that I may finish my race with joy. Paul just doesn't want to finish. Just get me to the finish line. I've been in some motorcycle races where I just, I just want to finish. I just want to, I don't even care if I get dead last. I just want to finish. And I didn't have much joy. He says, with joy, man. I want to finish with joy. 
and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Ah, that's priceless. Priceless. Romans 5, 2, I want to read this to you. It says, through whom we have, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is, Paul was, Paul was that. He was not, it wasn't just his message, he was standing in this grace. He was abiding in it. It was his strength. It was his foundation. It's what caused him to be unmovable and abounding. He says, indeed, I, I know, <laughs> I know that you all among whom I have I've gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Now he, he, he's not just saying, maybe you won't see my face. Now he's saying, I know you won't see me no more. This is the end. And then 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. This, and listen, listen, this is great. The word innocent here, okay? It's just not like he's just throwing his hands up and going, I'm, the, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. I, I did my job, okay? I, in obedience, I did it. Now you're responsible. I said the message, now it's on you. It's not what he's saying at all. In the Greek, it literally means here that I'm innocent, I'm clean, I'm pure, like a vine cleansed by pruning so that the, that the, that the, so that the, the plant is fitted to bear fruit. He sees himself as a vine that is cleansed by pruning so it's fitted to bear fruit. I'm innocent. And I haven't shunned. He says, I haven't withdrew. I didn't keep back. He's, he's saying in the Greek, I wasn't timid to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He's saying, I did it fearlessly. Is what I did. And if I'm doing that, you do that. 28, so take heed. After saying all this, this is what I did. Now you do. You take, you take heed. In other words, he's saying, beware. Give attention to. Care for. Apply yourself to your flock. To all the flock. He's saying, be devoted to. Put some effort into it, man. Go love those sheep. Go love those flock. Put some effort into it. Don't be a lazy preacher. You work for it. You preach it with some passion. I think just preachers need to hear this. You ought to sweat a little bit. You ought to get beat up a little bit. Get skinned up a little bit. You need some skin in the game. Take some heed. He was giving these men purpose. Giving them purpose. 28 take care of their flock which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood guys listen that's a heavy verse for a preacher even for a Christian or a Bible study teacher or a mother or a father that's deep that gets right up in your crawl up in your just gets you all mad Holy Spirit made you an overseer, an episcopos, a bishop, a pastor, the man in charge. He made you the man in charge. Take charge. Lead your flock in holiness, in godliness, with passion. Take heed. Shepherd them. Your King James says, feed the church. The New King James says, shepherd the church. The King James says, feed the church. Feed it in the Greek. Tend it, keep it, rule it, govern it, nourish it, nourish it. 
You know, there's a big difference between a kitchen that a woman don't cook in and a kitchen that a woman cooks in. It's truth. A woman, a kitchen that a woman cooks in all the time, or a man, a man can cook. Some of you men do cooking. If you're using that kitchen, it's going to look like you. It doesn't mean it's all nasty and nasty dishes, and but it looks like you use it. Some kitchens don't get cooked in. Some kitchens get cooked in. And they should look like they get cooked in. Some pastors, they don't do no cooking in their churches. They're not preparing nothing. And it looks like it. It's all clean and tight. It looks hip. It's relevant. Oh, it's cool. There ain't no cooking going on. There's no food being made. There's nothing put on the table for nobody to eat. It's just a bunch of fluff. Looks good. Feels good. But don't smell good. There's nothing in the oven. <laughs> They're not nourishing. If you're going to nourish your flock, it, you're going to know it. You're going to walk in and say, there, man, there's, some, there's something cooking in that church. Which he purchased. Which he purchased. The word here in the Greek for purchased, to make around oneself. Paul saying he purchased, he, he himself engulfed us around himself by his own blood. You women, you've been studying about the righteousness of God being imputed to you in your Bible study. This is the deal. He purchased. He, we are wrapped in him. He's wrapped around us by the blood of the Lamb. 29, here's another, whoa, watch out, take heed. For you know this, you, <laughs> it's almost like they've seen it a little bit already. You know this, that after my departure, savage wolves are going to come in among you, not sparing the flock, but scattering the flock. They don't care about the flock. They're not sparing of the flock. Savage, grievous. The word also means heavy or, or burdensome, violent wolves. Grievous wolves. Ones that lay heavy burdens on you. I could go back to Jesus, some scriptures with this word in it, where he's talking to the Pharisees. But let me just go to 1 John 5, 3 real quick here. Same word. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not savage. They're not grievous. They're not heavy, John's saying. They're not even violent. Like those bringing a, a false message. They're true. What do wolves do to sheep? Do they, they eat them. They don't reproduce them. They eat them. They devour them. They scatter them. In verse 30, so also, right? So also from amongst yourselves, he says, men will rise up. This is a, in reference to these wolves, right? Sheep's clothing. They'll rise up inside of your ranks within the church. They're going to look like they're something, but they're nothing. They're perverse, they're, bringing, they're speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Can I tell you something? If a pastor can't recognize that, he's not worth his weight in salt. And I'm going to tell you something. Beware of the brother or sister. While worship's going on in here, they got you out there. That makes me mad. It makes me really mad. It makes my wife even madder. And she's liable to say something like, get your big old buddy in the church. You got a nice little sheep being led astray by someone over here gobbling up and talking a bunch of nonsense and starting a bunch of heresy out in the hallway. Get in church. Worship. Oh, no, no, wait, wait. You want them to worship you. I'm going to pull you away from the flock so I got you all to myself and get you cornered out in the hallway. Don't let anybody do that to you. They're speaking perverse things. Don't do that. Get in church. You can talk outside. 
Give them your attention afterwards. And if they start talking perverse things, just walk away. It's a serious business. This is what he's saying. They'll rise up from amongst yourselves. They'll speak perverse things. They'll turn away. They'll turn aside. They'll distort. They'll draw people away after themselves. Not God, themselves. Watch, 31. Therefore, watch and remember. Watch and remember, church. That for three years, he says, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of, of, to the word of his grace. Look how often the word in grace has been going. Three different specific times. It's the word of grace. It's the logos of grace. God's unmerited favor. Wolves, perverse things, distort that. Distort that grace. I've warned you. Watch. They'll be against grace. They won't be bearers of grace, but of law. I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are being sanctified. The word here, watch, he's saying in the Greek, wake up, be vigilant. Again, take heed. He's warning you. And when he says, and I commend you, he's saying, I set before you. I set before you the word of his grace. I set before you the word of his grace, which is able. I love those, which is able. How many times do you go, God, I'm not able. I'm not able. You're not able. You're not able. God, I'm not able. I wish you just wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm not able. But your grace is able. His grace is able. The word of grace is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. When I read that word, I just, it just screams all the promises of God from Genesis to Revelation. An inheritance. Something I didn't deserve. I didn't earn an inheritance. It was given to me by blood right. My dad or my grandpa gave me an inheritance that they worked for, that they earned, that they made by the sweat of their brow. God, by his work on the cross, has given you an inheritance of grace. Enter in, daughter, enter in, son, to the joy of your Lord. Come home. Gosh, that's sweet. That's so sweet. Look at that. Just finish this thing out. 35 on down. He says, I, listen, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the word of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than receive. He sums this up, and, and he's talking to the elders in Ephesus. Work and give. And those are the two things people have the hardest time doing in the church. Both leaders and people in general. All of us. We don't want to work and we don't want to give. And Paul's committing them to this. You go and you labor I'm not trying to earn my salvation, but get after it. Paul did. His life was a witness. He started off with this, and now he's ending with this. Be passionate. Be a giver of yourself. As a leader, you've got to be, you've got to give. You've got to give yourself. You've got to be willing to come early and stay late and love on people and listen and sit with people and hear people and minister to people. That's what he's telling them to do. Just like the Lord. Chuck Smith was always, always, people always just thought the world of him. Because after every service, every pastor's conference, and you know what I'm talking about, he would stand right there, and the line would be 100 miles long, and he would stand right there until every last person he got to talk to him. And he got to pray with every last person and when you were talking to him, he wasn't looking over your shoulder. He wasn't looking at his watch. He wasn't like, oh, oh, oh. 
like some ministers. He was into what you were saying. He, he was ministering to you. Gosh, that's so beautiful. That's what Paul's saying here. 36, and when he had said these things, Paul, he got on his knees, man. He got low. He started off talking about humility, and here he is getting on his knees with these guys and weeping openly with them. And they're hugging on his neck, and they're kissing Paul because they knew they wouldn't see him no more. You're not promised tomorrow. And when this thing wraps up here, you better live for today. Appreciate today. Love today. Love on those you got to love on today. Minister to your wife and your kids and your grandkids right now. Because they might be gone tomorrow. God might just be done with them. He won't want to take them home. Stop griping and get on your knees with them. Start spending some time with them. Oh, let me tell you something. These men will never forget this moment with the Apostle Paul. You wouldn't. I surely, I know I wouldn't. I read this and I'm like, I would never forget this. It, this, this moment would change my life forever. Just reading it. I'm like, wow. You've got to be kidding me. That's ministry. That's effective ministry. That's powerful ministry. That's equipping ministry. That's building ministry. Man, don't think for a second those men didn't go back and love the snot out of their people and give them everything they got. It didn't matter. Maybe just a little. Maybe this pastor's not as fluent as this one or as eloquent as that one. But each man gave his flock everything they had every Sunday. That's commendable before God, right? That's powerful. How come that stuff ain't being preached, right? How come it ain't being taught in seminary? Stop being lazy, pastor, right? Boy, I'd, I'd love to teach a pastor's conference with that passage. I just go, I think they'd all get up and walk out. I just make them all mad. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for these awesome people, God. God, I for one never want to take not one person for granted. God, they belong to you. They're your sheep. The sheep of your hand. They're your flock. God, you died for us, man. You purchased us with your own blood. How powerful how crazy is that? And we, and we get to join together and we get to do church every week, sometimes twice a week. We get to gather and build each other up and encourage each other and pray for one another and strengthen one another and sing hallelujah together. That's good. That's good. Let us not neglect that. And let's bring people into that. That's contagious. That's contagious. That's a biblical church on fire. It's simple. Just simple stuff. Thank you, God, for blessing us with your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, um, just a quick second here. Uh, any, any prayer requests? I mean, you guys, you got tomorrow? Journey. Yeah, yeah, and then Karen, you're going up Tuesday of next week. It's all in my calendar, but so we're one of you praying for them. And uh, Steve? Trevor and... Oh, Yeah. Yeah, they're so humble, they wouldn't. But yeah, they're leaving uh, tomorrow morning. Trevor and Patty, you know, Patty's mom passed away of cancer and because of COVID and all the issues trying to, they're, do, they're having their memorial service uh, for her. And, uh, and so we want to keep Trevor and Patty and the family lifted up. They're flying out in the morning to, to California. And um, uh, any, any other prayer requests I can think of off the top of my head? Yeah, yeah, and his name was Shane. Shane. All right, 
God, we just want to come before you tonight as we finish out. We lift up these prayer requests and even the unspoken ones, Father. We want to lift up Doug and Karen to you, Lord, as they have this uh, this meeting. Uh, that they would get full custody of journey. And Lord, we, we know, we have faith this is going to work out. And uh, and you're going to continue to give them the strength and the stability and the wisdom and just everything they need, God, to just love on that little girl, Lord, and raise her up. And, and thank you for bringing them home from uh, North Dakota safely. And um, we want to pray for Tuesday for Karen, you know, going through this uh, procedure here and and, and lump, net, having this lump taken out and, and then the radiation that will follow. But Lord, you're going to provide and, and you're just going to put get, put peace on, wrap her around both of them in peace like a blanket, God. And just it, it, it's just steady peace. And Lord, we lift up uh, you, um, well, Shane. Thank you. I'm sorry. We lift Shane to you, Father, right now. And, and uh, in recovery, God, um, you know, you, you do what Shane can't do for himself. Father, you do what a doctor can't do for him. God, you, you do what only you can do. God, you, you heal him. You, you crave, you, you satisfy all the cravings that he has, God, for all the junk. And, and, and I pray that he would crave you, that he would, he would just desire you. Bring healing, God, to his life, this young man's life, God. And we lift up Trevor and Patty to you, Lord. We pray right now for their trip. Bring them home safe, God. And, and, and we just pray for the memorial service. I know Patty's going to be sharing. And, and I just pray, God, that, that, oh, that you would just wrap your arms around them, the whole family, how hard this has been, God. Again, you, you just be present, Lord, in our difficulties. And God, grant us the faith to trust you with everything we've got. In Jesus' name, amen.